Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here, and today we are talking about new Cybertruck photos, including of the interior, which I believe is the first time we've seen that since the prototype version. We've also got significant expansion for the FSD beta. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, but more on that today. Some new lawsuit information. Uh, we've got updates on Volkswagen and Ford, and a few other items as well. Not a whole lot to say on the stock today. Uh, pretty quiet, up a quarter of a percent to $716.66, so... Really not much action so far this week. The NASDAQ today was up nine tenths of a percent, but there was some pretty interesting broader market news today with Target issuing an investor related update. Uh, we'll go through this here pretty quickly, but it's pretty interesting and might have implications, especially as we head to the CPI report uh, on Friday. So Target today announced that they are taking a quote unquote set of actions to right size their inventory for the balance of the year and create additional flexibility to focus on serving guests in a rapidly changing environment. They say that that set of actions includes additional markdowns, removing excess inventory, and canceling orders. So that is a stark contrast to what we have been seeing for the last year, uh, where we're talking so much about supply constraints. This is Target talking about having excess inventory, taking additional markdowns, uh, and canceling orders. So hopefully that could be a sign that things are starting to cool down a little bit, and maybe a little bit less action is needed. Uh, you know, from the Federal Reserve in terms of interest rate increases to control the infl inflation that we have seen. Uh, Target also says that they are planning more conservatively in discretionary categories like home. So read between the lines there. That means their home sales, which were strong before, uh, are falling off. Some areas like food and beverage, household essentials, and beauty have maintained their strength, but uh, they're starting to see some deterioration in the trend in some of their other, other business lines. Um, and they also note that these decisions will result in additional costs uh, in the second quarter, which, you know, if you have any context on retail, which I do have a lot of uh, additional markdowns, that's always going to, you know, cause cause your margins to take a hit. Um, but sales will probably accelerate for Target a, a bit with those uh, lower prices. So it's definitely interesting to see that uh, maybe one of the first signs that we're seeing from, from retail of things cooling down a little bit and... We may not see that reflected fully in the, the May CPI report that we're getting uh, later this week, but definitely something to keep an eye on. All right, next up, moving into the Cybertruck. So we've got a report here from a local CBS station in California. Uh, you may have noticed yesterday when we talked about the PG&E project opening up uh, at Moss Landing, Tesla did have a Cybertruck there. And a few images and videos have surfaced out of that, which normally perhaps not all that interesting, but uh, since we've seen it so many times now, but we did get a photo of the interior. So just as a reminder, here's kind of what the interior looked at uh, prior to, uh, you know, some of the revisions Tesla has made over the last year or so. Uh, so this was kind of the concept version of the interior that we had seen at the release date. And the this is the new photo that we've got here from uh, this local CBS station. So you can see uh, this is pretty different. Uh, I've circled some of the things here that, I guess not pretty different, but a little bit different than um, what we've seen before, probably most starkly you can see there is the dash, no longer that, uh, you know, faux marble that Tesla interestingly had there uh, in the concept. Now it just looks like a black liner there. Uh, and you can see here, I've just circled kind of the other changes that I noticed, uh, particularly with the dash. We now have the second screen there, like we see in the Model S and X, which was not on the Cybertruck prototype. Uh, as you can see there, it was just the single screen. Uh, but we've now got matching over to the uh, to the Model X. And here you can also see that Tesla's updated the center console a little bit. Not major updates, but previously the uh, the cup holders were exposed. I, I would guess Tesla still has cup holders in here. Probably They're probably just covered here. Um, and then this other area, I'm guessing that is for charging of phones, where right now for in the Model 3 and Model Y, for example, you'd put that underneath the screen. Tesla does not and really hasn't ever had that design on the Cybertruck. So I'm guessing that's sort of where they'll incorporate the uh, the wireless charging. Just a couple of other things I noticed here. So the windshield does look the same. It's extending back quite far. I don't know if that's quite to where the Model X would be, uh, but pretty similar in design. And actually, you can kind of see here that the, uh, the UI right now is running the Model X UI, as Tesla doesn't seem to have that finalized, at least not on the prototype. Uh, we've seen definitely a lot of uh, the design patents for that or, or trademarks or whichever. I think it was patents that Tesla's put out. We've talked about those, but... Uh, a little bit, you know, too early for us to be seeing that on the prototype here. And then it looks like Tesla's got a little bit of piping on the seats. That may just be the lighting, but kind of looks like there's uh, a little bit of piping going on 
around the uh, you know the outside of the the seats there. So definitely interesting to see those updates. Uh, nothing too major, I'll, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's it's looking pretty similar. Probably the biggest change being that dash, uh, and then of course we're seeing the yoke there, like we had seen in the prototype. We do also have a few photos here, just kind of nice to look through. We uh, won't go through them too <laughs> intensively, but you can see here just some nice glamour shots of the exterior that were posted up on Facebook. Um, so just kind of nice to you know, see the Cybertruck in in really high resolution and uh, a nice setting out there on, on the work site. Probably the only thing here is to notice is on the back door, you can kind of see, um, you know, Tesla's playing for the door handles. It's of course, those have been removed. I've talked a bit about those, but this might be the highest resolution shot that we've seen of those so far. Um, and then of course, in this version, you'll probably notice that the wiper looks a little bit different. Uh, I think it's maybe just not fully assembled in these shots. You can see it's just kind of, you know, looks like it's about half the size of the, the previous prototypes we have seen. Good shot right there too. Uh, and just as a reminder, this was the previous prototype. So I don't know what's going on there. It, it kind of looks to me like with the not smooth edges here, that this is just sort of a not fully assembled piece. So I'm not reading too much into that at this point, but definitely a little bit noticeable. All right, so next up, we've got news on FSD beta expansion. We talked about this yesterday because Elon had said that it was rolling out to 100,000 people. Um, we now know a little bit more that uh, the expansion has been significant. So I had wondered yesterday if that 100,000 people was just getting up to 100,000 since Elon had mentioned that number previously. Looks like maybe it actually is an additional 100,000. We can see on Twitter here, uh, somebody with a 93 safety score getting FSD beta. I've seen reports of 91 getting FSD beta. So it may have moved all the way from you know 90, 91 to 100 scores uh, with this expansion, which would be a huge, huge update. If it is 100,000 extra, that would be a doubling, um, rough doubling of the FSD beta program. So that kind of brings to mind the question of, okay, is this enough for Tesla to actually start recognizing some of the deferred revenue that they have on their balance sheet as a part of the um, expansion? So let's see, I think I misplaced one of my links here, but Tesla has, we'll see if we can find that. Oh, it is here, okay. <laughs> so Tesla over the next 12 months in their latest 10Q, so from the first quarter, they said that they expect to recognize $948 million of revenue over the next 12 months. Um, presumably that's primarily related to the recogn recognition of FSD beta, which you can see up here that they say they've got a couple billion or so uh, deferred revenue related to that. Just for context, that's because Tesla hasn't fully delivered the features that they have promised. Uh, FSD beta gets them much closer. Even if it is still a beta type of a situation, Tesla can start to recognize that revenue. We've seen them do that with things like Smart Summon in the past. So there is a possibility here in Q2 with such a sizable expansion that Tesla could recognize some of that. Now they're probably not gonna recognize all of this 948 million, but keep in mind that this isn't, this number that we're talking about here, that's not the entirety of what they have deferred for FSD. So if Tesla recognizes even just a little bit more of this feature, whether that's from the people that now have access to the feature or um, from further expansion, then we could see at least a sizable chunk of this uh, being granted. So just to give a little bit more context on this, Zach was actually asked directly about this on, I believe the Q3 2021 earnings call. Uh, so he's asked just, you know, what's up with the, with the deferred revenue for FSD? Does it really need to be past a level two system for them to recognize it? And Zach was a little bit vague, but if you kind of understand the history of FSD beta and just how Tesla has sold that over time, it kind of makes sense. Um, so he says on your question about the criteria for release deferred revenue, Quote, the way that this works is we have made certain commitments as to what this product can offer at the time that a customer has purchased that. And so what we have to assess is have we met those commitments and is the software widely available to folks that we've made those commitments to within a certain geography. And you know, given that FSD is currently still in the beta phase, it's imitation only and it's limited, we have not deemed that to be appropriate for recognition of deferred revenue and we'll continue to evolve this. We'll continue to monitor it with the finance team to see when we get to the milestones in which we're comfortable releasing. So what he's talking about there in terms of, you know, we've kind of made different commitments to different customers at different points in time. Tesla at some, some point did update the language behind what they were actually selling as FSD. Um, previously it was kind of 
you know, your, your car will be able to drive itself completely essentially. And then over time they kind of made it into softer language that your car would be able to drive itself, you know, in, in cities and take turns and, and manage those things. It was a little bit more constrained. So that kind of divides up the FSD beta group into two groups where one is more difficult to get that revenue recognition where Tesla kind of has to solve it beyond level two. And one actually Tesla can start to recognize things at a level two type of a system, which is more where we're at today. So point being there, it doesn't necessarily have to leave beta and it doesn't necessarily need to be worldwide or anything like that for Tesla to begin recognizing some of that, uh, that revenue. And we could very well see them start to recognize it for at least that group that it has started to roll out to because it really is delivering that final feature of city streets driving, even if it's not fully autonomous. So it'll be interesting to watch for that for Q2. I don't necessarily expect them to, but um, definitely something worth keeping an eye on and might make some sense as Q2 is a, obviously going to be a tougher quarter with the shutdowns uh, to recognize that during this period. All right, next we'll go through this quick. It's just a quick update on uh, Elon Musk Twitter deal, which I know people are kind of tired of hearing about, but this is a, a fast one. So CNBC reporting today that Elon has basically put efforts to arrange financing for the Twitter acquisition on hold. Uh, previously, despite some of the pushback that we have seen Elon give, there has still been active attempts to coordinate financing. Uh, and it sounds like those have now been put on hold according to this report by CNBC, uh, which sounds like it's mainly being reported from private equity um, sources near Apollo Global Management or other related private equity firms telling this to CNBC. So the other thing that they note here is that, as we kind of talked about yesterday, the uncertainty of the deal has also weighed on the plans to get that debt financing, uh, which Elon actually called out directly in his request to Twitter uh, to facilitate the you know, access of that data. So this makes it look a little bit more real that either this would be walked away from or, you know, put on hold sort of indefinitely. We could end up seeing this go into lengthy litigation. Um, hopefully, hopefully not, but it's best to be prepared for, for an outcome like that. Speaking of litigation, we've got an update here on uh, Tesla's sort of back and forth um, with California. So... Elon has made mention to this before. We talked a little bit about uh, Matt Taibbi alluding to this in a series of articles that he's writing. Tesla has felt like the California uh, Department of Fair Employment and Housing has overreached their purview, basically, and has basically just been too heavy handed and aggressive with some of the lawsuits that they have filed. So Tesla is now... Um, pushing back on that and they have filed a complaint with the California Office of Administrative Law uh, basically regarding the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, which of course is, as we've talked about, suing Tesla for racial discrimination. So Tesla pushing back on that and basically saying that, you know, they're they're moving too quickly on this and they did not give Tesla the required information specifically not letting them know about all the details behind the claims or potentially approaching them about a settlement before filing the lawsuit. And um, yeah, so that's what that is without first notifying the company. Um, and they've also said that this is not just a Tesla thing. This has happened with other companies as well, citing the uh, Activision lawsuit on uh, sex discrimination. So the other update on this is that a California state judge said that he would likely deny Tesla's motion to pause the lawsuit, and that's the lawsuit of DFEH against Tesla while this pending complaint uh, is reviewed. So not putting that on hold. We'll know more on that tomorrow. Um, and then this isn't a DFEH response, but it's related. In a court filing last month, they said that the state law does not impose strict requirements on them to, you know, have discussions with the employer regard, um, regarding what they plan to sue them about prior to the lawsuit. So, yeah, it's I mean it's it's all going to be sorted out by the courts. Um, but as we've seen from Elon's tweet about Tesla kind of lawyering up, um, they're starting to get more aggressive in that regard. We've also got an update here on the lawsuit that originally started as a hundred thirty-seven million dollar jury award, uh, also for racial discrimination. That was reduced down to 15 million. And I think Tesla still had plans to appeal that, 
but the uh, plaintiff also wanted to appeal that to get it back up and that has been denied um, in the courts so I still think there's more to come on this but that's just the latest update that we have on on that story all right next we've got some news on the Idra gigapress so as we've talked about that open house is going on right now so uh redditor isael probably butchering the name on that but he actually had a chance to attend the open house event and shared some of his thoughts from that event and a few photos here as well so we can see the gigapress uh you know in a, in the most complete stage that we have seen it idra has been providing some teaser videos but we really can now see that this looks like a you know fully set up, ready to go Gigapress, which is really exciting, and that suggests that after this open house event, hopefully Idra's ready to you know disassemble it, uh, ship it to Tesla, and Tesla can get it uh, ready to go for the Cybertruck, which Elon has previously noted is the intention. Of course, the paint job kind of gives that away as well. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting here uh, doesn't mean a whole lot to me particularly, but for those that are a little bit more engineering inclined, there were a few shots here of some of the diagrams of the machine itself. Uh, so pretty interesting, you know, look at the dimensions um, and just how the, how the machine is coming together. So we'll keep an eye out for any more takeaways from that. Um, he had mentioned that he'd kind of heard something that maybe Idred said that 9,000 tons was kind of approaching the maximum without any significant changes to the design concept. Um, they could maybe go a little bit beyond that, but kind of approaching that maximum at this point. And of course, that Tesla was not difficult to work with, but um, you know, pushes them to go to new levels very frequently. All right, next we've got an update on Tesla's use of radar. Kind of an interesting filing today with the uh, FCC. So this is basically. Um, these these things get published after lengthy periods of time of review. So this report here is essentially, from my understanding, was started back in April of 2018 and is just now being, being published. So during that period of time, of course, Tesla has revised their radar strategy. So I'm not sure exactly how relevant this is since it was started such a long time ago, but this would be getting clearance for use of a new radar, which you can see some of the details um, about here. Green, the only on Twitter who accesses a lot of details in you know, Tesla's code that people like me are not able to access, has seen that Tesla has had some code in there for an imaging radar, essentially a higher definition radar. Um, he's noted here with this filing that the frequency is in line with exterior, exterior radars from Bosch and Continental. So I know we've seen Tesla talk a little bit about or have filings for interior radar. Uh, but green is suggesting that this would be an external radar which of course is a little bit confusing since we have seen tesla drop that but perhaps just waiting to get to this newer version um and sort of add that in with with hardware 4. so it's interesting there's there's more detail in this filing but again that's not my area of expertise so unfortunately i can't comment too much more on uh, what tesla's doing there with the radar but definitely interesting to see that pop up uh, all right, next here we've got an update from Volkswagen. So this was shared by Berlinergy on Twitter, and this is about Volkswagen. So we've talked before about their efforts in software, basically starting this huge software undertaking, I think probably two years ago, they put billions of dollars into funding this development, which strategically probably makes sense. It's definitely an important area for the future um, in terms of the auto market, but as we have seen reported many times now over the last few years, there seems to be quite a bit of internal conflict on how this um, is making progress. Uh, so this is a report from Handelsblatt, and we can see here, you know, after startup investments of more than 6 billion euros, the, the future project is mainly producing trouble. The various programs are severely delayed and incompatible with each other, and promise leaps in quality have failed to materialize. According to the information from the Handelsblatt, the cause of the misery is a fundamental rift with the board of management. It talks about how there's conflict between Volkswagen CEO Herbert Diess, the Audi CEO, the Porsche CEO, which, I mean, when you talk about three CEOs in a couple of sentences, it's not probably all that surprising that there is, is some conflict. And that's just pretty much the story that we've heard from Volkswagen so far. Um, even with the ID 
3 launch, you may remember that Volkswagen had issues and had delayed shipments from software, and that was before this, you know, huge, I don't know exactly how to say it, I think they say Cariad is what they're calling it, um, but before this huge software undertaking, we've, we've seen software issues from uh, Volkswagen even prior to this, and every report that we have heard on this effort so far has been, you know, of that same variety. So it talks about how group sales will soon have to explain to customers that the new flagship models like the electric Porsche Macan and Audi Artemis e-sedan could be delayed by up to two years because of this software um, and some of the issues that they're having uh, with the with the development. So it'll be interesting. Apparently there's going to be, apparently the board has given Deese like three weeks to give them an update on this and, you know, how they're going to resolve these issues these issues so definitely a challenging time for for Volkswagen with some of these things again they seem to be wanting to move in the right direction but there's so much internal conflict against or I guess at least Deese seems to be wanting to move in the right direction but there's so much internal conflict against that uh, that has just been you know step by step uh, a challenge for Deese and I think we're continuing to see that here with software and even if everyone were on the same page it's such a monumental task to shift the organization in such a massive direction um even from the start you know there were comments about how big the software team was going to be there were going to be like ten thousand developers or something like that and you know that's <laughs> it's not just about throwing a, a massive number of people at the problem all the time all right last couple of things here um we've got an update on the ford lightning so we've heard last week about jim farley talking about how they've got to go to sort of one price and um you know have this all be modeled after the Tesla experience. Ford is currently far away from that. So this was shared out on the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning forum. A new Ford F-150 Lightning vehicle at a dealership. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what state this was in, but as we have talked about with previous electric vehicle launches, including the Ford Mach-E, when there is a new vehicle like this, the dealers will put on these massive market adjustments. You can see here a $69,500 market adjustment on the price of this Ford F-150 Lightning, bringing it up to a total price of $140,000. So no surprise there that Ford wants to, uh, you know, stop this from happening. They've said that they've made that clear to dealers, but clearly some dealers are still being willing to take a risk on, on you know, whatever that relationship is and make these market adjustments anyway. Last thing and then, just a quick update on uh, SpaceX. So Elon Musk apparently According to CNBC's report here, last week told CNBC or told SpaceX employees that the company isn't likely to take Starlink public until 2025 or later. So we had previously heard that maybe it could be a couple of years. There have been kind of conflicting rep reports on this that have popped back and forth. Uh, but according to the latest information here from CNBC, looks like we'd still be you know three or four years out, kind of at the earliest there, for an IPO for Starlink. So. I think that is it for today. Um, that's where we'll leave it at least. And yeah, as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you are subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Wednesday, June 8th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.